we're going to go to our next session, which is going to be about an hour long. But uh, one question that, that we didn't get to that we thought we would start off is this first question, which is, what do you do if the patient wants more diagnostic tests and you don't feel that they need them? So can we go to our panel and, and how do you approach that? I'll start by saying I trust your physician. You should, you should. <laughs> and if anything that we do together is not making sense, we'll talk to them again. Okay, that's good. <clears throat> yeah, I, th I think this is something that comes up a lot, obviously, and uh, I think you're on much firmer ground. Uh, for me, it's actually quite easy in the referral setting because almost always everything's been done right. multiple times. <laughs> now, you know, if, if, if you're not in, in that particular situation, you know, obviously uh, making sure that you explain to the patient why a test is or isn't appropriate is helpful. And then um, I oftentimes will negotiate with the patient. So what I'll say is, you know what, um, we will think about doing said test if we try said therapy first. And if, if the therapy works, then we, don't, we won't need to pursue the test. But if the therapy doesn't work, um, you know, we'll go ahead and do the test. Now, the, the nice thing is it seems like a negotiation, but of course, that's exactly what the guidelines say, mm -hmm. which is that you should try empiric therapy first, and if it doesn't work, then pursue diagnostic testing. And I think if you um, uh, lay that strategy out, patients are much more accepting because they feel like you haven't closed the door or discounted or ignored what they're asking you to do. It's simply putting it into context for the patient within some logical progression of events. Yeah, I actually did that last week where I, the patient's symptoms had not changed. So I said, <clears throat> you know, I don't think we need that right now because you, I just remind them what they have. Sometimes they don't remember. They didn't re remember they had like three CT scans. You have to actually remind them. And then I'll say, but if your symptoms change in this way, then we'll consider it. So I actually did that. I think Lynn. Yeah, so, so one thing I try not to do is basically get into a confrontation with them where I'm like, nope, not going to order that test or that's what they think I'm saying. So I usually do two things. One is I try to figure out why they want the test. So sometimes it's, you know, their neighbor had pancreatic cancer, um, but they're 20 and their neighbor's 80. Or, you know, their mom said, you, you know, you definitely have H. pylori. That's what my yoga instructor told me you had. So, you know, I first try to figure out what the test is and, and what they want it, what they want it for. And then if I can explain what the symptoms of, you know, pancreatic cancer are and why I don't think you have that. And then the second thing is usually I take that as a sign that I was not able to adequately explain what I actually think they have. So sometimes I say, you know what, like, look, I'm a GI. I, do, I could do a colonoscopy on you every day for the rest of the week, and that would be great. But let's, you know, pause for a second, and let's get back to, you know, what I think you have. And then at the end, you know, I definitely want to revisit this, because I do want to make sure that if you have a concern, you know, we talk about it. Yeah, Doug Drossman has this <clears throat> really nice video that I've watched ad nauseum because he forces me to. Uh, but it's in this <laughs> situation <laughs> where the uh, patient is saying, I have pain right here, and I want another CAT scan. And he says to her, if we got another CAT scan, would you be satisfied? And she says, yes. And, and he says, well, for how long? And she said, like, how long are you going to be satisfied? And she said, yeah, I see what you mean. Like, because you know that it's, you're only doing it. And then I've tried that, but it hasn't worked. They don't say, I see what you mean. Yeah, that's right, exactly. <laughs> They're like, yeah. <laughs> uh, but a lot of times, <laughs> what I try to do also is to explain the, the physiology of why they're real symptoms. And I actually had a patient who wanted a CAT scan, and I explained why she, these symptoms are real and why she, why, what, what it is the mechanism by which she has it. And I was kind of surprised that she said, oh, I, I don't think I really need that CT scan. That doesn't always work that way, but I tried to explain why she had the symptoms. Yeah. Suzanne? Yeah, so as Lynn said, I always try to assess what is the underlying fear that is driving this need for these tests, yeah. which is what you alluded to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think, you know, too, the, the key is, and this takes some practice for sure, um, but it's, it's to somehow get the patient to the point where they decide they don't need the test. Right. Yeah. You know, so in other words, for you to explain you, until your face is blue and tell them they don't need the test, is never as effective as having a conversation with the patient and having them come to the conclusion that, yeah, we'll put off the test or we don't, I don't need the test. And 
again, that takes some practice, and um, this, it's worth spending some time just thinking about your strategy in terms of that. But, but I promise you, it works a lot better if they feel like it was their decision than if they feel like it was your decision. Okay. We are going to go to the latter part now of this overview, which is non-pharmacologic treatment of functional GI symptoms, diaphragmatic breathing uh, to treat symptoms, and behavioral therapies. So uh, the next talk is ABCs of non-pharmacologic therapy of functional GI symptoms, and it's Kirsten Tillich. Thank you, Lynn. So um, this is a part of the, uh, the session that I really like is non-pharmacological therapies. I have to say this year, in speaking, I, my favorite non-pharmacological therapies are going to be covered by my colleagues because the mind-body uh, approaches the ones that I really um, resonate for me in my practice and what I see my patients getting the best responses from. But I really have to look at, at all of them. So it's a very broad area. And so I, I chose the, the sort of simple ABC here um, to cover three kind of areas. So one is acupuncture for these GI symptoms. One is botanicals, all the different herbs and spices people show up with. And the third is cannabis, because it's something that certainly in Los Angeles, California as a whole, and I think across the nation is becoming increasingly something that patients are coming to the table with questions about. So these are areas obviously that we were not taught about in medical school. I wasn't taught about in medical school. Um, but why, why do I care about these things that really aren't my job? Um, and I think you guys understand because it turns out that the patients bring them to us and they become part of our job. And, uh, you know, and I do acupuncture now probably half of my clinical time as part of my job in the past five years because of patient need. I, I found that I, I, I provide different services than I did when I started out 20 years ago. So our patients are using these therapies. Uh, you know, almost half of my patients will be using some kind of complementary alternative therapy. They're spending a lot of money on them. So in studies showing $200 a month or more, so they're invested in them. They're invested in them because they feel like they work. Uh, majority of these interventions are supplements and herbs that have a little data behind them. But if 80% of them find them helpful, it's really important for me to figure out why they find them helpful and maybe even more helpful than what I prescribe to them that I think I have data to support. Um, and if I understand what they're doing and I can at least, sort of like I alluded to earlier, um, if I can speak to them with some authority and understanding of what they're bringing to the table, then we can start to have a conversation. Where I found that if people would say, yeah, I'm doing this herb and I'd never even heard of it before, it's really hard for me to say, yeah, I think you should or shouldn't do that. So I think some minimal knowledge is, is really useful, certainly with uh, uh, the population that I see. Sometimes the things that they might be doing might be harmful. Uh, and sometimes, certainly in my work at, at the VA, I have a lot of patients that really can't afford the things that they're doing. They're buying stuff with a very limited income source. And I, maybe I can help them understand what things, if they want to spend money out of pocket, they, they should or shouldn't do. And so the symptoms that we're looking at here, are the basic GI symptoms that we see day in and day out, so dyspepsia, Maybe heartburn, nausea, vomiting, bloating, the constipation, the diarrhea, the IBS in general, but also um, the overall sort of stress sensitivity, the brain gut pieces, uh, the, the nervousness or hypervigilance or uh, insomnia, all the things that come together with any kind of chronic illness. Um, and, and sometimes that's really what they're reaching out for, not uh, necessarily the bowel symptoms. So starting with acupuncture, um, this is a, a practice that's been around for, for thousands of years. Uh, it's based on the idea of maintenance of health rather than treatment of specific disease processes, though it's evolved and certainly in this country we, uh, we use it for, uh, a in a little bit of a westernized way often. Um, but the idea is, is incredibly different than in Western medicine. Um, the concept are that uh, there are these energy pathways that track through the body. In these, uh, these pathways, uh, when energy is disrupted or blocked in these pathways, or if energy is too high or too low, symptoms develop. And so uh, in acupuncture, you assess where this dysregulation is, and there are specific points that may help this, this, this 
return to homeostasis, to balance. And it's a, it's a completely different model when we talk to patients. And so before I, I did this training to, to understand acupuncture better, I would have patients come to me and they'd say, oh, I saw my acupuncturist and I have a liver problem. And I'd say, like, I, no, you really don't have a liver problem at all. I don't, you know, get that. And I would try, you know, have to reach out. What, what are, what's going on? Why do they feel like they have a liver problem? Well, these energy pathways are named after organ systems. So some of you who get acupuncture may be aware of this. There's the kidney and the bladder and the liver and the spleen. And the energy meridians are named after organ systems. But it's really useful to know that when someone comes, so it, an, a common pattern with someone with IBS, maybe liver chi stagnation, so the energy in the liver is stagnated, spleen chi deficiency, and when the patient comes and talks about what's going on with their spleen or liver, uh, according to their acupuncturist, it really doesn't have to do with the solid organ. It has to do with this conceptual framework. And so I can explain that to the patient and allay their fears and also allay my concerns that they were given this, this uh, incorrect information. It's just a very different system. Despite that, there are a lot of modern studies, uh, uh, preclinical and clinical studies, that have started to look at the mechanisms of acupuncture because certainly the idea that energy pathways are running through the body and by putting needles in, uh, we're uh, changing the, the uh, invisible energy flow and uh, changing the course of disease does, is very hard for me to integrate with my Western training. Um, and, and my choice, to be honest, is really to just leave them separate and treat the patient in parallel, but for some patients and some physicians, that's very difficult. They really want to find that integration. And so there, there are a lot of studies that have shown, yes, acupuncture does modulate the autonomic nervous system. It can uh, release endogenous opioids. We see that people become very relaxed uh, and uh, their stress level drops considerably while they're getting a treatment. Um, Changes in, in uh, corticotropin releasing factor, changes in uh, collagen production in some studies. Um, and uh, some of this emerging uh, scientific data is really helpful for us to see. One study even looked at changes in uh, gut permeability, so meshes with some of the other questions that patients arrive with. So acupuncture has a, um, a long history and for people who have brain, gut, total body, systemic disorders, it can be helpful for some patients. And over the years, I'd sort of disregarded it. Earlier studies didn't show much help in IBS. I've been focused on IBS and functional disorders since really my fellowship, so quite a while. Um, and so I kind of, uh, the data doesn't support it. Um, but emerging data is, is actually looked a bit better. So if we look at, um, some of the preclinical work here. Um, I'm not sure if I can see at the right angle, but there, there's an acupuncture point here called stomach 36. It's one of the most commonly used acupuncture points that there is. And they've actually looked at this in, in animal models and found that it blunts the stress response. So it, again, this idea of, of bringing back to homeostasis. And it does this uh, in a vagally dependent way. So in the animal models, if you uh, get rid of the vagus, you have uh, you have obliteration of this response. And so what it does is the classic CRF-mediated uh, stress response where your stomach slows down, you get loss of appetite or nausea, the distal colon speeds up a bit, you get uh, urgency to defecate. That is blunted with uh, electrical stimulation of this acupuncture point mediated vagally. There, there's a, I mean, and it's kind of puzzling because the vagus doesn't go anywhere near that part of the body. This is in your lower leg. But uh, uh, the studies show that this works, and we find that it's very effective for patients. You'll see it in most of the uh, IBS-related uh, acupuncture protocols. There's another meridian in the body that goes up the front, front of the body, uh, the conception vessel. And there's a point that's about midway between the umbilicus and the xiphoid process. Uh, and this point, conception vessel 12, shows to the opposite. So it actually can slow gastric motility. It appears to be sympathetically driven. And it actually is, uh, utilizes the same uh, uh, receptor pathway or uh, neurotransmitter pathway that capsaicin does, the TRPV1 pathway. So there are some um, interesting emerging uh, pathophysiologic mechanisms of acupuncture that may be relevant. 
So here's a study that looked at electroacupuncture, which is just putting a little bit of electrical uh, stimulation to the, to the points for functional constipation. And this study looked at uh, both sham, so non-acupoint, uh, and true acupuncture, and, and looked at the number of uh, complete spontaneous bowel movements, so one of the measures that, that we're looking at. And you can see in the first eight weeks they're getting therapy, they've got an increase in their complete spontaneous bowel movements with both groups, but more with the true acupuncture group. And then they followed them out 20 weeks, and what you see is they, they uh, have some persistence in the benefit even without getting more acupuncture. This is a study that is um, a bit unique in the size, so you could see the end value there. There's over, over 500 people per group there, so it's a large study, and so it's some pretty, uh, pretty good benefits there. Uh, Meta-analyses, and there have been several, uh, show that most of the studies that we have in this area are, are smaller studies, um, but in general, we see improvements in bowel movement frequency and overall uh, symptom benefits. So this may be an area of constipation where acupuncture may be, may be helpful. Um, there is less data in the area of dyspepsia, but here you could see uh, in this study, looking again at true and sham acupuncture, looking at uh, one of the things they looked at is complete symptom resolution. We rarely even dream of that, um, so don't, don't usually ask. But in this, uh, in this study, 17% of the patients at the end of their uh, treatment course, uh, or follow-up from the treatment course, had symptom resolution. Six percent of the sham group had treatment resolution. And in terms of their adequate relief at the end of the follow-up period, which is weeks after the end of acupuncture, they had, uh, 62 percent had adequate relief. And that was uh, significantly higher than those in the sham group. Um, they also looked at uh, one of the dyspepsia questionnaires, the Leeds dyspepsia questionnaire, and, and saw, again, dyspeptic symptoms were down. And so here again, using some of these key uh, points that have been shown to be useful for uh, autonomic function, gastrointestinal function, and then picking some other points on the body that are not thought to be lying on these en energy meridians. So there may be some benefits for functional dyspepsia as well. Now, an IBSD is a little bit more mixed. There are a couple meta-analyses. This one shows uh, in, in uh, IBSD using it along with Chinese herbal medicine, uh, which is something that we're, uh, you know, certainly in medical acupuncture we're not trained to do, but people will, will be doing in the community. They again showed, compared to uh, usual care Western, what they call Western approach, they show benefits uh, of acupuncture. They didn't specify what uh, the specific usual approach was uh, across all of the studies. Um, in these studies, the data is, is often low quality. It's coming from smaller samples or smaller studies that they've collected together. And there are some question about the specificity of the benefits. Uh, are there provider effects? Uh, are there uh, what we call sham or ritual effects? And there's a lovely study that was done over a decade now ago by Tony Lembo and Ted Kapchuk looking at uh, sham acupuncture as a tool to enhance placebo. And so they looked at sham acupuncture in IBS patients, all comers. They didn't differentiate by bowel habit. And they looked at them uh, with uh, a provider that didn't really talk to the patient and a provider that had a warm and uh, welcoming provider manner and spent a lot of time with the patient. Obviously, the sham acupuncture worked better with the provider interaction than it did without, and we know that from, from uh, the work that we do with our patients. Acupuncture has a very high placebo rate, and there may be some very, what I like to call, nonspecific effects. But the, the emerging data appears that there is some uh, specific effect along with that nonspecific effect, and the side effects are, are quite low. So overall, I think the, the data is looking better these days than certainly it was uh, 10, 15 years ago for functional GI disorders. And so I, I do use it in, in part of my care of patients. 
Now, botanicals is another area that is really emerging, and this is something that comes really from the patients more than from uh, the provider side. I think most of us are familiar with using enteric-coated peppermint for gastrointestinal symptoms, and the data is, is reasonable, and this is something that I do regularly. It's the only one of these things with, I guess, ginger. I often will recommend ginger for upset stomach, for nausea. Um, a lot of the, the data is very weak, but I think safe and uh, anecdotally, patients really seem to respond to it. I think it's low risk. But the rest of the things on this list, um, I would say, have really very little data, despite the fact that I see it a lot. I worry about things like uh, ashwagandha, which is considered an adaptogen. So the thought is that this is a class of herbs that relieves the stress response. Uh, and brings the body back into balance, which is something we think we would like in people, particularly with stress-associated symptoms. But it also has uh, one of the most common side effects is GI upset. Uh, same with turmeric. I mean, turmeric has some good data for a number of different anti-inflammatory properties, but one of the key side effects is, is often GI discomfort, and it may increase the risk of bleeding. So we want to know what people are taking, particularly those of us who are taking biopsies of people because I have seen some issues there. Primrose oil, again, not a lot of data, but I see it coming to me a lot. Uh, Iberogas, which has been around for a long time, does have some reasonable data for, for IBS and dyspepsia, and I will use it um, uh, for patients. One thing that we need to know that uh, fairly recently there's some cases coming out showing um, really florid hepatic failure and people using Iberogast. So these herbs, though they could, some of them have some data that shows that they can be helpful. Just like any of the drugs we have, you can see florid uh, hepatic failure with Augmentin and we, we use that. We have to be cautious and, and be careful uh, if there are known side effects that we're letting patients know about them and, and, and choosing them appropriately. Berberine is one where there's some emerging data that it may be helpful for IBS. I'm not comfortable saying that the data is there yet, but that's something that I'm keeping my eye on. So when people come to me with this long list of things that they're taking, my approach is usually this. Let's go through them all and tell me how much these helped your symptoms. Did this help your symptoms by 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%? And then we'll decide what we should do about it. And most people will say, I have I, I, to know. I, I mean, I started the, give me this, and then I added this, and they really don't know if they're helping them or not. And so I said, well, let's do this, because a lot of people don't want to stop them. I say, let's stop them all, and then if you want to add them back one at a time, let's see if you feel better or worse. Oh, well, well, I'm behind. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is cannabis. So uh, cannabis was uh, used medically for, for many, many years until it became illegal. Now it's come back. It's medically legal in 47 states. It's legal recreationally in number, uh, and that's increasing. Users report benefits for a lot of GI symptoms, including chronic pain, nausea, vomiting. Um, but the concern is it can also have uh, some effects on the GI tract. And so what we know from the science of it is that THC, which is the psychotropic uh, part of cannabis, and cannabidiol, which is thought to have potentially some anti-inflammatory properties, can affect the GI tract by slowing down the, the gut motility. And that may be something that could be a, a benefit or could be a problem for people with, with IBS. Or, or other functional GI disorders. IBSD is an area where a number of people have brought up, this makes sense, right? We have people who have pain sensitivity and we think that, that THC may be helpful for pain. They have stress issues, CBD may be helpful for stress. They have disrupted motility, maybe we can slow it down. We have maybe a little bit of inflammation or immune reactivity and maybe we can help with that. Well. This is an area that is sort of, uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of tempting, but we really don't have the data. And what we all have to have the data on are the significant potential risks of cannabis. So it turns out substance use disorder in up to 30% of chronic users, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, which looks a lot like cyclic vomiting. We don't know how common it is, but in an ER interview of people who, uh, hundreds of people who use cannabis more than 20 times per month, there may be up to 30% of them who have at least some of these chronic symptoms, though the severe disorder is much less common. 
they can actually impair sleep, can impair, can worsen anxiety, potentially increase the risk of MI, uh, and, and a number of other things. So I'm not ready to say to my patients that cannabis is a useful thing for their, for their symptoms. I tend to take a, a very cautious approach to it. But I'm happy to talk about it further because a lot of my patients completely ignore me on that. So, <laughs> So, so I take, try to take a balanced approach. I take, try to take a patient-centered approach. I don't say no. I say, this is what I know about that, or this is something I'll find out about. And I try to minimize the number of things that people are taking and maximize the amount of time they spend doing things like breathing carefully, meditating, uh, or, or doing other, uh, other things that may actually have data to support the benefits that the patients are looking for. Stress reduction, decreased uh, reactivity of the gut, decreased nausea, decreased pain, improved bowel function. So that's it, thank you. Yeah, so, so, so Kirsten, you know, probably a lot of patients will come in and they say, you know, should I use CBD products? Yeah. Uh, like, think about some of the, like, classic types of questions a patient would ask you, and how do you respond? How do you think, like, if you were going to give advice to the audience? Yeah, I take it in a, I go from a data-driven way. So I say, we, right now, we don't have any data to support the use of e either THC or CBD products in your GI disorder. So if it's IBS or functional dyspepsia, we have some data that there may be some dangers. And one of my concerns also is that this is an unregulated area. And so if I go to the cannabis shop and I say, you know, I want this product that is, you know, 98.3% you know, CBD, who's checking that? Nobody. We just don't know. We're, we're really giving this market incredible amount of trust that we would never give a pharmaceutical industry. And these are pharmaceuticals, really. So I tell them that. I say some people who use cannabis regularly can have some significant disruptions in the brain-gut axis that can lead to vomiting syndromes. So we have to be careful. Um, and then, of course, I, they're going to make they're going to make their own decision based on what they choose. In general, if you have somebody who's anxious, high THC is going to be more of a problem. And so I'd be happy with their, them using CBD, which is anxiolytic. You can think of them sort of like a seesaw. One has more of the dopamine release; the other is brings you down a little bit. So, if they're say I'm going to use it anyway, and I have a very anxious person people with PTSD, I'm going to say, yeah, go with the C high CBD. But I don't know what you're getting. Yeah. I'm going to add one other uh, question from the audience to the panel. is about L-glutamine. And using L-glutamine, are there any side effects? What do you use? When do you use it and what dose? Bill, do you, you, you probably use it? Or? Well, the, the study that was Genial. published by Nick Vern's group down at Tulane mm -hmm. um, used five grams three times a day. So it's actually a, it's a big dose, um, but uh, that is the dose that most people right. are use, using. When I recommend it in clinic, um, and I occasionally do, uh, I, that's what I recommend, five grams three times a day. Janelle? You, um, with a potential side effect can be constipation. Um, so I was, if a patient is more constipated, I may not suggest it or I may start slow. Um, yeah. Or if they have a fear of becoming constipated, I'll start at five grams once a day and titrate up to the, the recommended, you know, the evidence-based dose, but based on their tolerance. Yeah, so the, the patient population that was studied was the post-infection IBS diarrhea group who had increased intestinal permeability by a urine, a lactose mannitol. Uh, test. So that was actually the patient population that they used, and it was four we eight, eight weeks? Four weeks. Four weeks? Yeah. Okay, so you might want to limit the, the amount of time you use it to see if it works. Okay, so uh, I have a uh, patient case. Uh, this is a 28-year-old woman with a history of chronic abdominal pain, bloating, visible abdominal distension, worse for several years. She had GI symptoms initially that started in childhood with chronic constipation and improved with laxatives and dietary changes. She associates the onset of her symptoms with increased stress associated with bullying from her previous best friend in high school, you know, mean girls, uh, switched schools, in her, she actually had to switch schools in her senior year. 
Uh, her recent symptom flares are associated with increased stress from work. Uh, she follows a relatively strict elimination diet. She's gone ex undergone extensive laboratory imaging, gastric emptying, and endoscopic testing, which were negative, except for recurrent positive lactulose hydrogen breath tests. Her physical examination was normal, including a, a um, digital rectal examination. Her recent treatments were mainly to treat SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. She's been prescribed multiple courses of antibiotics with rifaximin, neomycin, erythromycin, amoxicillin, azithromycin, augmentin, and fluconazole. And they would help her transiently, and then her symptoms would recur around once a month. So for over a year, she's been on monthly seven-day courses of antibiotics, and she alternates between augmentin and fluconazole. And her most recent lactulose hydrogen breath test was normal. Stress was so severe that she was told by several doctors that she needed to quit her job. She now works as a freelance makeup artist, and her stress levels are under better control. She has symptom-related anxiety. Exercise does help with stress. And she was started on Prucalipride, 2 milligrams daily for her constipation. She also takes over-the-counter peppermint capsules with lunch and dinner. So in addition to um, being an exorcist to get rid of the SIBO concept and <laughs> antibiotics, uh, what would be your approach? How do you manage abdominal bloating and distension? Could we have like a few of you could maybe give I, your approach? I tend to explain to patients that bloating is one symptom for a myriad of different, different underlying causes. And so, um, you know, we need to go through a process of elimination to address it. But I, my favorite thing is to educate patients that it can be a nervous system response, not only a food response. Yeah, I think this patient is a particularly um, dramatic case, so it would be more complicated than just the typical bloating case. But one thing I do try to get at is sort of what Janelle alluded to. Do I think that this is a bloating response to food, and like, is this really have something to do with digestion? Uh, is this one of the? Is this a really reflexive bloating? So I usually ask people if you just if you just have water. Right. Do you bloat right away? And when you ask that, it's surprising how many people will say, yeah, how do you know that? And if they say, I just have a little bit of water and I bloat, you know it's reflexive. And you can really, it's a, it's a great window into the brain-gut axis because they've just told you something that when they stop and you say, like, how do you think that could happen? It doesn't make sense, does it? And they're like, no, it doesn't make sense. And you can explain how they've developed this reflex of any kind of distension of the, of the stomach leads to this over response. And, and it can give them um, some insight as to how this may, ha how this may be um, exacerbated by stress. I do often go to the diet as well. I mean, this person's on an elimination diet, and it's hard to know what that means. But um, I'll often work with our GI uh, dietitians to try to identify foods that may be triggers as well. Because for some people, it's not quite as dramatic. But if there are things that are triggering her, her bloating, um, I mean, clearly this is a case where you really have to target the underlying stressors, and it sounds like probably some early life trauma that is still playing out. So, Bill? Yeah, I, I like to think about, um, I'm going to sort of incorporate all the previous comments. Uh, I, I try to put people into constructs if I can. So, there's bloating in the setting of constipation, okay, and so, um, and this, in this particular case, people were thinking about motility and treating constipation with Montegra or with uh, Percalipride. Um, that's fine, but just remember that dyssynergic defecation also is commonly associated with bloating, and, it, and we published data on this, others have as well, that when you have manometrically proven dyssynergia, um, if the patient has bloating, in addition to the constipation getting better after biofeedback, actually abdominal pain and bloating also frequently get better after um, physical therapy and pelvic floor retraining. So, don't forget about that. It, it's, there's mm -hmm. the issue about slow transit, and then also evacuation disorders can also be associated with bloating. Um, then there are the patients that have more food-related symptoms, uh, like Kirsten was talking about. And um, in that, there's kind of two categories. There's the patients that 
complain about bloating immediately after eating, and then there are the ones that tell you that they get up in the morning and they're perfectly fine, and through the course of the day they become progressively more bloated, and by evening time they're really miserable. And um, you know that that is oft, all, also oftentimes, especially if it's associated with distension, um, fermentation related. So um, thinking about dietary strategies, for example, in those patients um, can be very helpful. And then the the mind body part, particularly in the patients that have bloating and not so much distension, um, is is I, I think really important to pay attention to. And then finally. Uh, and I suspect we'll hear about this in the lecture, but there's this whole confusing entity of abdominal phrenic di dyssynergia. So this idea that your um, diaphragm and your abdominal musculature is out of sync, leading to um, problems, postprandial problems with, with di bloating and distension. Yeah, I, I always think about it as what goes in, what goes out, and how are they feeling? So what goes in, I think about diet which is what you said, what goes out, are they constipated or they have dyssynergic defecation? And if you got those things covered, then I think about that it's more of a visceral hypersensitivity, which bloating and pain are linked to uh, lower pain thresholds. But uh, so thinking about that, uh, of course, uh, recommended a multidisciplinary integrative approach. Um, I'm not a big on probiotics, but you know, it may help bloating, so there, there's definitely evidence of that. Uh, continue procalipride to make sure she doesn't have constipation that could uh, you know, uh, be associated with bloating and distension. She didn't really think the, the ca peppermint capsules were helpful, so I told her that she could, you know, stop using them or use them as needed. I referred her to a GI dietitian because she had this prolonged elimination diet. Um, she was screened positive for ARFID. Uh, she restricts diet due to a fear of recurrent symptoms, and she actually wants to eat um, and has a good appetite. And so she's going through gradual reintroduction of foods. Also refer to her to Suzanne, our GI integrative health practitioner, that you're going to hear about diaphragmatic breathing and why that's helpful before and after meals and mindfulness meditation. And then one thing that I was considering is prescribing her a SNRI to help to reduce the visceral hypersensitivity uh, that I think was linking to the pain and, and bloating. But that's something we'll consider after she tries these other uh, modalities. So we are going to go to diaphragmatic breathing for GI conditions uh, by Suzanne Smith, who you heard from yesterday. Good afternoon, everybody. So yesterday I talked about diaphragmatic breathing in regards to rumination, but I'm going to talk about it today a little more broadly. So I'm just going to talk about what is diaphragmatic breathing and the physiology, how can we use it with digestive disorders, and then um, we're all gonna practice together. So diaphragmatic breathing is simply voluntary slow breathing with active control of the diaphragm and the abdominal muscles. And you might also know it as belly, abdominal, or slow breathing. So we naturally breathe this way when we're relaxed. And it's an effective means of balancing the autonomic function. And there's many studies that show, when, well, not many studies, but there's some studies that show that um, when you practice this regularly, it increases vagal tone and heart rate variability. And these are all signs of a resilient nervous system. So one of the things that I love about it is that it's a tool that you can offer patients to give them a sense of control and empowerment over managing their symptoms when they arise. So here's a picture of the diaphragm, again. <laughs> I actually think this is an underappreciated muscle in our body, but then again, I'm biased. But look at all it does. It's involved in breathing, swallowing, vomiting, and it contributes to the reflux barrier. And so, once again, this, in this esophageal hiatus, this is where the esophagus comes through, but this is also where the vagal nerves come through, the left and right trunks. And then we have this right crust, which is helpful in rumination syndrome and um, GERD. So let me just mention about the vagus nerve a little bit. So it's the largest nerve in the body and it's called the wandering nerve because it wanders all the way from the brain stem down to through the trunk of the body. And it is one of the factors in the bidirectional communication for the brain gut access. And we know that um, there's top-down involvement, but the gut also sends messages up to the brain, so it's bi-directional. The vagus nerve is involved in adaptive responses to stressors. 
and it's the main affector and effector of the parasympathetic nervous system. And we know that the parasympathetic nervous system is also known as the rest and digest system. And this is because it facilitates lowering heart rate, respiration rate, and it increases digestion. So how many of you notice that when somebody cuts in front of you on the freeway that your breathing might change a little bit or if you're fearful or scared? Right? So our body adapts to our physiological responses. But what's really cool is we can alter our breathing to change our physiology as well. And so we can modulate the parasympathetic nervous system by taking slow breaths and this elongated exhalation. So what happens on inhalation when you're breathing from your diaphragm? So we, like, we breathe in through the nose, and as we breathe in, the diaphragm, the diaphragm contracts, it flattens, and it moves down. And what this does is it helps bring air into the, down into the lower part of the ribs, and then there's a slight expansion in the lower part of the ribs laterally. And then what happens is the abdomen release, relaxes and extends. And then on exhalation, what happens is the abdominal muscles help the diaphragm recoil and relax. And then the air is expelled out of the lungs, and then we like to instruct to breathe out through pursed lips, because that way we can control the flow of air, and that's where the parasympathetic activation happens. So what's the evidence for diaphragmatic breathing for GI conditions? Well, there's not a lot of evidence. I talked about rumination yesterday. I'm not going to talk about that again, but it is the first line treatment for rumination. And basically, when you practice diaphragmatic breathing, you can't have that physiology of rumination because it's really incompatible with that. So GERD, there are a couple studies done on GERD. One was on just patients with acid reflux, and the other one was done on patients with acid reflux and belching. And what they found was there was a significant reduction of PPI refractory GERD, but these patients practiced every day for 30 minutes, which is a long time to practice, and they showed that there is improved pH metry on these patients, as well as at follow-up at six months, that stayed that way. But about a 50% decrease in belching, but they all, most of them experienced increased quality of life. So you just might think about this as an adjunctive treatment to treating your patients with GERD. And then there's abdominal distension. So how many of you have had a patient come in where they talk about that they look six months or eight months pregnant at times? And maybe they do in the office or maybe they don't at that time. So there was a study done and um, this, this study was done on people with vari variable periods of distension, so just on these kinds of patients. And these patients had functional disorders of IBS and functional dyspepsia, so they had some visceral hypersensitivity. And um, they, their symptoms were triggered by meal ingestion. Could have been from drinking water or eating. So um, they had 24 in each group, and what they did is they had three sessions of breathing with EMG over a 10-day period. And then they had them breathe five minutes before and five minutes after each meal. And this was a placebo-controlled trial, so they also had a group where they hooked them up to the EMG, but they didn't give them instruction for breathing, and they had them take oral cimethicone after each meal. So first I want to distinguish between bloating and distension because they're different, but they are related. So bloating is a perceived sensation by the brain. It's a feeling of fullness. Whereas distension, there's an objective measurement that abdominal girth actually gets bigger. And so what they found in this study is that this perceived feeling of bloating, which could be pressure, maybe it's discomfort or pain after a meal. What that did is this is, this is, a, this is the hypothesis. We don't know for sure this is what's happening. Um, but that this message was sent via the spinal cord up to the brain, and then the brain sent, sends a message to, for the diaphragm to descend, and then that causes this protrusion in the abdomen, causing this distension. Okay. So, so this is a schematic of that, this um, mechanistic hypothesis. So we have here the, the visceral hypersensitivity. 
This is the brain gut axis. And then the somatic perception, whatever it is, whether it's pressure, you know, pain, discomfort, bloating, going up here. And then what the, there's these impaired viscerosomatic reflexes that um, Dr. Tillich was talking about. And what they say is that, you know, well, first of all, the diaphragm is controlled by the phrenic nerve. So the, it's called abdominophrenic dysinergia. This is, this is this hypothesis. How many of you have heard of this or are familiar with this study? It's actually quite fascinating. So um, you might want to read about it because it could be, you know, at play in some of our patients. So um, they had a 56% reduction in, in the symptoms of uh, distension. And they also um, did CT scans that they are showing that this is not necessarily gas. I think there was like 22 milliliters more of gas at the most in these patients. So what are some other symptoms that we can use diaphragmatic breathing for? Well, pain, right? So we talked about this as an, being able to modulate our nervous system, anxiety. A lot of patients, when they start to feel their symptoms, they have anxiety. So doing diaphragmatic breathing can activate that parasympathetic nervous system. This symptom of urgency, sometimes, you know, when people have urgency, they have fear of incontinence, so they can modulate this as well. It really helps modulate the stress response, right? So bringing in that parasympathetic activity. The same thing with... Um, the nausea. Sometimes people have nausea and then they have this fear that they're going to vomit. How about people that have difficulty letting go of stool? I oftentimes have people practice this on the toilet. Now, not for 10 minutes, but, but just to focus on their breathing and sit there and breathe from the diaphragm can activate that parasympathetic nervous system and many times it can help patients let down and have that bowel movement. And then we talked about dyspepsia because gastric accommodation is vagal mediated. So if you have these patients that have these symptoms that are triggered by eating itself or drinking that we were talking about, you can have them practice for five minutes before and after meals. Okay, so when you're teaching a patient to breathe from their diaphragm, it's best to first demonstrate the technique, talk about the physiology, and then evaluate how are they doing, and then give them guidance. And I talked about this yesterday, but it's really important if you can, if you have a place for them to lie down, is to have them lie down, because then they're sending a message to the brain, it's time to relax, and then they typically start breathing from their diaphragm, and then you can just go from there. And then once they demonstrate the proper technique, you can, you can teach them sitting up. So that's what we're gonna do right now, is we're gonna practice diaphragmatic breathing together. So first I'm gonna give some instruction and then we'll practice together. Okay, is this on? Can you, can you hear me? Okay, because I can't really hear that you can hear me. <laughs> so what we're gonna do first is before, we're not gonna breathe from a diaphragm, but I just want you to take a really deep breath and then just kind of let it out with a sigh. And you know, this is a really good opportunity to disconnect from our phones, our computers, and just take a moment. So once again, taking a deep breath in, and then just, and as you're breathing out, just let your shoulders drop, your neck relax, and let your body relax into this chair that's offering you support. Okay, and then we're gonna place, I'm gonna turn a little bit sideways so you can see my, my abdomen here. So, Placing a hand on your chest and one, you can place it under your ribs or a little bit lower on your belly, whatever's most comfortable for you. And then what we're gonna do, so we're, we're gonna basically breathe in through our nose and as we breathe in through our nose, our, we're gonna focus on this hand and the abdomen's gonna come out and then we're gonna slowly release that breath through a small opening in the mouth because we want that exhalation to be longer to turn on that parasympathetic activity. Okay, so. So and breathe at your own pace, it's really important. So we're gonna breathe in through the nose. The diaphragm comes down and contracts and the abdomen distends. And then pause a little bit in between. And then you're gonna slowly release that air through a small opening in your mouth as the abdomen falls. Okay, once again, breathing in through the nose. The abdomen rises, pause in between. 
and then let that air slowly be released through pursed lips as the abdomen moves back up. So on this next breath, what I want you to do is kind of connect with the qualities of the breath. So taking a deep breath in, slowly through your nose, feel that expansion and that openness of the in-breath. The body's receiving this breath that's giving you your life, and then there's a little bit of pause. And then as you're breathing out through the mouth, just really connect to that feeling of ease and relaxation. Okay, so some of you might notice that you feel a little bit lighter or more relaxed and some of you might not. But the important thing to remember is that any time we can just slow down and take a few breaths because you don't have to have GI conditions to to, um, take, you know, do some deep breathing. And I don't know if you remember, but yesterday when the... uh, doctor was talking about burnout, he, he actually talked about diaphragmatic breathing as one of the things to do. Because it does, it's a really easy tool to modulate our nervous system. So um, I usually have people practice about 10 to 20 minutes a day and they can do this in one sitting or break it up into two 10 minute periods or five minutes, four times a day. But I really work with patients individually to see what works best for them. It's important to learn how to do this because this can be an unconditioned response. Your brain gets to know how to do this breathing and then suddenly when you feel a little bit of arousal, it'll just kick in. Because I have a lot of patients who try to use it when, oh, when they're stressed or when they're having their symptoms but they haven't practiced and they tell me, well, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And I'm like, but you're not in a state to be able to do it. You have to have practiced this before. So I just wanna, let you know that we have recorded a video. It's about seven or eight minutes on diaphragmatic breathing with some demonstration. And it will be up on the web, this website in about two to three weeks. Um, so please, if you, you know, want to direct your patients to it or you want to watch it yourself, you can. And then just in summary, diaphragmatic breathing can voluntarily influence our autonomic nervous system. It's beneficial for some GI conditions, so just think about it as adding it you know, as an adjunctive therapy. It's accessible, cost-effective, and it doesn't need a prior authorization. And it provides patient with a tool of empowerment, which is what I really love about it. And then I just, here's the website again. So, so thank you for your attention and participation. Did, did everyone feel kind of relaxed? It was only three breaths, huh? I mean, it's kind of I, I should have done it before I, I, I ran down the stairs and fell and hurt my ankle. I should have, I should have done the breathing well, at, the, at the top of the stairs. Really and then maybe I would have gone slower. Stairs. Yeah. Okay, so we are going to our final talk of, the, of our session, Behavioral Treatments for Functional Gastrointestinal Disorders, Disorders of gut, Brain-Gut Interaction by Christina Gentili. Thank you. So as uh, Dr. Chang mentioned, I'm going to be talking about then evidence-based brain-gut psychotherapies. And I just wanted to draw our attention to a best practice update that was published in 2018 by Dr. Lori Kiefer and and colleagues. And this is going to help set the uh, the, the tone for what I'm going to be talking about today, how we can include behavioral treatments to help patients better manage their symptoms, reduce uh, symptom expression, and help enhance quality of life. We want to integrate these as early as feasible for the patients and really just foster this whole person approach to digestive care. So I talked a little bit about these treatments today and uh, for the interest in time, I might um, do a a general summary on some so that we can really hone in and focus on the the referral criteria and patients who are likely to benefit. Generally speaking, the distinguishing features of these, uh, of these treatments is that they are GI symptom focused. We're not treating a major depressive disorder. We're not treating anxiety. We're not monitoring suicidal ideation. They're, they're targeting the patient's symptoms and it involves the patient to take a really proactive and collaborative role. They're going to be coming into session. They're going to be learning skills that are specific to their symptoms in their level of perhaps symptom-related anxiety or stress associated with their symptoms. 
and they're going to be then practicing these skills at home, and then we're going to be reviewing them together. So treatments are usually short term, uh, approximately five to seven visits, which is, again, different from uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for, for example, panic disorder, which could be anywhere from 16 and up uh, sessions. So beginning with uh, GI-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, what we're doing here is that we're looking at the interacting relationships between our thoughts, emotions, symptoms, and gut sensations, the impact on the autonomic arousal or autonomic nervous system, and behavior such as avoidance, like avoidance of food, avoidance of public places where a bathroom might not be available. And unlike using CBT for depression, we're conceptualizing and approaching this in light of the brain-gut connection. We're trying to understand what are the cognitive affective and behavioral variables that are precipitating and perpetuating the patient's current difficulties. So when we think about different targets of treatment, we can, we can uh, target different areas um, that can help impact anywhere along that figure that you can see on the, on the slide one of which is stress reactivity. So as Suzanne has just reviewed diaphragmatic breathing, can we start to interrupt and uh, affect change at that level? With GI-specific anxiety, looking at anxiety and worry that is specific to gut sensations, any uh, fear about um, having a bowel accident in public, for example, and how can we use different cognitive behavioral treatments to help um, enhance quality of life and reduce symptoms? Symptom catastrophizing, uh, the, I talked about this yesterday, and this would be uh, patients who are making these exaggerated uh, threat appraisals about everything feels very, very awful, and there's nothing that I can do to manage. There's very low self-efficacy. In addition, inflexible problem solving. So these would be our patients who are trying to seek control over an uncontrollable stressor, um, such as their GI symptoms or sensations. So this is just an example of a thought monitoring log that a GI psychologist will use. I don't want to focus too much time on it, but essentially what we're doing here is we're using psychoeducation. We're helping the patient develop self-awareness and insight into these patterns, and then we can use it as a target to help us identify which uh, columns or areas will be most effective for change. Another key component is uh, modification of arousal, and we're trying to help the patient learn how to uh, pr learn how to have more self-mastery over their nervous system. So many times patients will have already met with Suzanne, so what I'll do is reinforce um, the diaphragmatic breathing or help uh, augment it some more, maybe with guided imagery, and provide any corrective feedback between maybe when the patient saw Suzanne and when they're coming in to see me. The other key aspect of cognitive uh, behavioral therapy for GI disorders includes cognitive restructuring. So we're looking at then these un at these unhelpful belief patterns about symptoms. So for example, with bloating and distension, as we've been talking about earlier, one of the things that I want to do to understand is even what are the patient's underlying beliefs and associations with bloating and distension. You know, we live in a society that is, has a high degree of obsession on body image and appearance, so I'll try to understand what are the patient's thought processes around that. When, how did they describe bloating and distension? A lot of times it's not uncommon to hear women uh, talk about having this uh, perception of themselves as being fat or looking pregnant, and you can really get to this sense of emotional reactivity related to these uh, symptoms or feeling like they might be embarrassed in public, which might say to me, in my mind, there might be a social anxiety component. Um, so these are just two different uh, techniques that psychologists will use. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to promote more adaptive thinking skills. We're trying to, with the evidence-based thinking, uh, what we're trying to do is help the patient learn, based on their experience, are they making an unrealistic prediction? We're not trying to make a prediction that's based off of, uh, off of our feelings. We're trying to look to our experience. So when a patient tells me that I fear I'm going to have a bowel accident on my first day of work, one of the things that I will ask them is to then provide me with the evidence that has 
that's, uh, that uh, supports that belief or supports that thought. So we're trying to help the patient have more evidence-based appraisals rather than anxiety-based or emotional-based appraisals. And similar with decatastrophizing, we're trying to help the patient learn how to go from this worst case scenario to a more realistic outcome and supporting their ability to cope. With gut-directed hypnosis, this is another common treatment modality that's used by GI health psychologists. Uh, there's a lot of uh, research and there's also several treatment protocols. And what we're doing here, it's a uh, form of uh, deepening one's relaxation response. As I talked about yesterday, we're using things such as deep breathing, um, pro progressive muscle relaxation, and imagery. But we're targeting then the patient-specific symptoms. So we really want to have this be uniquely ta tailored to the patient's symptom experience and the sensations that they're experiencing. And the uh, hypnotic suggestions then are helping the patient uh, have, in a, in a way, this exposure to those sensations, so promoting this idea of acceptance in a non-threatening manner, and also uh, reprocessing how the patient is perceiving these symptoms or sensations. So maybe they're not as, uh, as scary or burdening or bothersome, and we can do that to also help influence on symptom-related anxiety. So these are just two different um, area, ways in which we can influence um, these hypnotic suggestions, looking at targeting stress on digestive functioning. So can we use phrase and words and imagery to help the patient feel as if they have confidence in their ability to manage stress and then saying to them, for example, more and more, you feel like nothing can disturb you, like nothing can disturb your deep sense of comfort or cause you pain. Something I commonly say a lot. <laughs> and we can... Um, also alter pain perception. So, you know, more and more you may find that sensations no, no longer feel bothersome, they bother you no more um, than the gentle sounds of a, you know, gent gently flowing uh, ocean wave. So we're pairing imagery and we're trying to help patients have more of this positive association so they're not as alarming. And patient, usually patients come in, we'll, they'll, we'll have about seven sessions. Some patients require less. Some might want booster visits. It's all dependent on the patient. And they practice at home. And then from there, then they, it becomes more of this home uh, self-mastery approach. So I wanted to focus on today, and I, I'm talking about then who are the patients that are likely to benefit. Um, this is something that commonly comes up from providers uh, with regard to how do I make a referral. So when we think about patients who are the most appropriate candidates, these are the patients who have stress-sensitive GI symptoms. We can see this temporal relationship between maybe chronic stress, maybe there's change of job, change of work, uh, moving, the stress of their symptoms, not having symptom relief. And so there's this relationship here when stress is unmanaged, we tend to see worsening symptom expression. GI symptom anxiety, so this is anxiety then that is specific to their gut sensations and then these, that pattern of fear and avoidance where they're slowly starting to take themselves out of their own life. They're not really engaging in things that bring them joy or what they value. Um, they're maybe not interacting socially with loved ones, they're not going to dinner, they're not trying, trying new foods, they're not going to restaurants. And the anxiety is really specific to their, their GI symptom and sensations in that experience. With regard to poor adjustment to symptoms, these are patients who might feel very, very overwhelmed and do not know how to cope or know how to manage. Um, maybe they were just diagnosed with a new condition or there was a change in treatment plan and they have, they're having dip difficulties accepting this or incorporating it into their day-to-day -day or learning how to manage these symptoms while they're going to work, school, being a parent, uh, being a spouse. Patients with symptom catastrophizing, so this is a little different than what we would see with catastrophizing and depression, where everything across the board in depression feels very hopeless and helpless. Usually what we might see is that it's the, the focus, the target of focus is on the symptom and sensation where they feel as if everything is going wrong, they don't have any control, but they have insight into how their mind is thinking about this and they, and they have some degree of motivation to address that because they, it's burdensome to have those thoughts as well. As well as then difficulties with symptom management that goes back to that sense of adjustment. 
So patients who, for, for GI health psychology, who are inappropriate referrals, these would be the patients who have a predominant psychiatric issue. Uh, there's a psychiatric comorbidity present, such as a major depression, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder that's relatively current or active, a predominant eating disorder, such as anorexia or bulimia, or obsessive compulsive disorder. When the symptoms are severe, excessive, or untreated, it's best for the patient to have those symptoms managed first before we start to uh, have them engage in GI health psychology. And if we think about it, you know, the approaches that I'm using with the patient are short term. And with some, somebody who has major depression where they have this increased risk for suicidality, they're going to need more, more continued support to, to monitor that mood and to make sure that they have those emotional coping skills in place. So sometimes even what I'll say with patients, if they come in and, and we start to see this uh, psychopathology unfolding, is I'll compare it to you know, taking Psych 101 in school. You're going to do Psych 101, and then once you have some control there and we, we see some improvement, you're going to come back and do like Psych 404. It's really hard to go to that senior level class when you don't have that baseline foundation. And so usually when I explain it to them, to patients in that lens, they're very understanding. Um, we're not taking it off the table. We're just saying it's not appropriate right now because we want to see you uh, manage, have better management of mood. In addition to any active substance or alcohol abuse, with the exception of medical marijuana. And lastly, if the patient is not open or receptive to behavioral approaches, it's going to be very unlikely for them to have some benefit. They have to want to engage in the treatment. They have to want to, to practice the skills at home. There has to be this willingness to incorporate it into their lifestyle. Just, just like nutrition and diet, it has to be part of their lifestyle. And just like anything that Suzanne might recommend or I might recommend, we're, we're, we're talking about making a lifestyle approach. So when discussing the referral for GI psychology, you know, we want to think back to all of those um, wonderful communication skills we all learned about building trust, building empathy, validating the patient's emotional response to their symptoms, normalizing how difficult, how difficult it has been for them, and using our patient-friendly language. And when you're working with a patient, you know, it would it's helpful then to then just tune in with yourself and ask yourself, does a patient have any predominant worry about their GI symptoms? Do they have in an unusual degree of stress going on? Um, do they have any problematic coping behaviors where maybe they're not taking rest breaks and it's just work, work, work all day long? So you can use this to help yourself guide how you might introduce this, uh, introduce the referral to the patient. So it's best to start with the physiological aspect, focusing on the, the, the patient's GI symptoms, and you can do that through the brain-gut connection. If you, if you lead with the, I'm going to refer you to a psychologist, we, they might shut down, so we don't want to do that. So if you provide education on the brain-gut connection, and we talked about this in the panel discussion earlier, and so you can use examples from the patient's presentation. So if they're talking to you about how they have a high degree of stress, you can integrate that in and maybe even talk about this fight-or-flight response that's going on and how it's impacting communication between your brain and gut. And once a patient has some understanding there, you can tell them then how you have this great person that you know who to refer to who's going to work with you on helping strengthen that brain-gut connection. So making sure the patient understands that the behavioral treatment is to target the brain-gut connection. And this is going to help them improve symptoms. It's going to help them have more quality of life and build resilience to how they manage stress. And we really, really want to do um, a great job with understanding that the patient knows this is not mental health treatment. And if the patient is very overwhelmed or anxious, there tends to be some biases in information processing. So you want to check in with the patient in their understanding to ensure that they heard you correctly and they understand the referral. So you can have the patient summarize for you what you just talked to them about to make sure you can correct any misconceptions so that it doesn't dampen your rapport, that patient-provider relationship. Because again, treatment is short-term and it's for the brain-gut connection. The other very, very important component is that as a provider, you want to reassure the patient that you're not just, you're not breaking up with them. You're, you want to tell them that I'm going to be involved in your care um, throughout 
throughout the journey. I'm still going to be following up with you. I'm going to be working with this psychologist. He or she is going to be giving me updates about your treatment plan, and we're going to work together as a collaborative and integrative team. This is about your digestive wellness. So you want to ensure the patient know, knows that you're not just sending them off to, to, to psychology. And sometimes when that's happened, patients will come to me and they'll, they'll be angry, they'll be frustrated. And I've had patients say to me, my, doc, my doctor told me to come see the shrink. And I was like, okay, hi. <laughs> so it, we have to do then some correct, correction there and making sure one, um, what education can I do to help restore that relationship the patient has with their provider? And two, help ensure the patient's understanding that we're not doing mental health treatment, we're trying to help uh, support how you're managing your symptoms, reduce symptom expression, and have better quality of life. And then at the end, um, using that open-ended question, again, depending on how much time you have in your encounter, but I'm wondering what questions or thoughts you have about the referral. You know, this can provide that checkpoint to ensure the patient knows that this is, again, brain gut treatment for symptoms, and you can provide any, any corrective feedback the patient might have. So this is usually the million dollar question that I receive is how do I find a GI or just a health psychologist? So good news and bad news, I think. <laughs> so the number of GI health psychologists I, we're increasing, um, so there, there's more and more of us. The Rome Gastro Psych Directory is a great first step, um, and that there's going to be more psychologists added to that website in time. Um, I didn't, don't have the website listed, but if you punch that name into Google, it should be the first hit that comes up. And you can filter by state. Um, does a pers person work with a, a adolescent versus, versus adult? So you'll see more in time. Um, more providers being entered into that directory. The American Board of Professional Psychology, uh, this you could look to find a board certified health psychologist to have this um, basically quality insurance knowing that this person has skilled expertise in health psychology. The other would be the National Register of Health Service Psychologists, and they're a, a voluntary based board where they verify a provider who uses this, um, who verify, verifies a provider's uh, background, experience, and you could also filter your search to find somebody who might have experience with chronic medical issues, cognitive behavioral therapy. So when you're looking for who would be a good fit, you want the person to have licensed professional experience in health psychology, and what does that look like? Does this person target the medical piece or do they do psychotherapy with people who have depression and, a, and IBS as a comorbidity? Because those are going to be two separate treatment plans. We want to see the person to have expertise in cognitive behavioral approaches because as we know and we've heard uh, between today and yesterday, GICBT is one of the evidence-based approaches and we want to see if do they have any application of that with medical populations. So if it's not directly related to digestive conditions, um, sometimes chronic pain can be very helpful because we see some of the overlap in terms of like uh, catastrophizing, for example. And lastly, if the provider indicates that he or she is skilled in hypnosis, um, the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis is a gold standard for training uh, for healthcare providers in uh, hypnosis, and you'd want to ask the patient, what supervised experience do you have? Is it okay for me to address? Okay, so there was a question that came up. It was asked yesterday, too. Are services for a GI psychologist covered by insurance? So as I mentioned yesterday, it depends. It's going to going to depend on the patient's policy and what their insurance coverage is. I bill using, using the health and behavior codes, which means I'm using a medical diagnosis. Depending on the psychologist, if they're using a psychotherapy CPT code, that could in, impact reimbursement rates. And they're also billing for a, um, a, 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 billing a psychiatric diagnosis. In terms of other options, the, you know, this will also be dependent too. Can we get a referral maybe for an in-network provider from the patient's primary care provider or asking the insurance panel for an in-network provider and seeing do, does the provider meet any of these criteria on this list? Okay. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, yeah, so also, um, I just want to remind, because there was one question about FODMAP information. So Bill Che's last slide actually has website information and resources. Uh, I think most of us are going to be staying here for the rest of the meeting, so you can come up and ask us uh, these questions. I'm sorry we couldn't go through all the questions, but we'll be here to answer them uh, because I have to move on. But I really want to thank the uh, faculty for uh, giving fantastic uh, talks, and during lunch everyone said how much they enjoyed the panel discussion. So let's give them uh, some applause. I think they did a fantastic job.